Today, we're going to continue looking at integration, thinking of integration as multiplication, but one of the factors is continuously variable. So thinking of integration as addition. We're going to continue looking at integration as uh, uh, through area and volume. Area is equal to length times width. Volume is area of a cross section multiplied by the height. Two applications based on the same operation. So they should have the same effect when we start doing integration problems. So let's take a look at um, let's talk about a region bounded by some functions. So we know that we find the area under the curve by integrating from A to B. Let's draw a picture of this and think about this problem in terms of area as length times width, and not just area under curve is definite integral. So this graph will have y-axis, x-axis. And then parabola. So there's the parabola nine minus x squared. So this happens up here at nine, and this will happen down here at three. And then we've got zero. So the region we're considering is the region bounded by the graph of nine minus X squared. The X axis and the Y axis. So this is just the area of a parabola or a piece of a parabola. but it doesn't fit into our list of areas that we have nice formulas for. Area of a square is length, uh, side times side, rectangle length times width, one half base times height, pi r squared, average of the bases times height. And all throughout that list, we don't find parabola. So we have to make it up ourselves. The problem is that if I say the base is three, then the height varies continuously from zero to three. And we can even turn the problem sideways. <clears throat> if we consider the base to be zero to nine, then the height is also going to be continuously variable as y goes from zero to nine. We'll have a different height for every y value. In the other direction, we have a different height for every x value. And it's changing continuously. It's not just that it's uh, different values, it's changing all the time. So here's what we're going to do. I'm gonna say that since the, I'm gonna draw a slice and I'm gonna say this shape, like all shapes, are just stacks of rectangles. Any area is always just a stack of rectangles. Draw what those rectangles look like. I'm gonna draw a typical rectangle.
Then we're going to apply our integration thinking. Uh, so for any value X, I have a different height. For every value of X, I have a different height Y. For every one of these values, I have a different height Y. That means I don't get to use multiplication, so we'll use our calculus thinking. And I'll say for a little change in X, the height won't change that much. So I'm just gonna assume that the height remains constant for some small change, delta X. The area of the slice is just a rectangle. It's the length times the width. So I'm going to call, I should use height, but I'm going to call this the width. And here's the length. So the length is the dimension that's getting smaller so that we can fit it into the stack of rectangles. So in this case, the rectangles are getting thinner in the X direction. Now we see that the length is delta x and then the height is just called, I just called it w. And also notice that the w is the y coordinate at that point. So I could say that this is y times delta x. If that doesn't work, I can't, I'm not, I can't integrate y with respect to x. Well, I could. But that would mean if y is constant and y is variable. That's the whole point of doing this whole process. Fortunately, it's easy to write y in terms of x. If y is 9 minus x squared, then I can just replace this y with 9 minus x squared. So the area of the typical slice is 9 minus x squared times delta x. So the total area will be the sum of all these slices. And that, uh, then we turn it to an infinite number of slices. So the sum of an infinite number of slices. And that will become a definite integral. We're integrating the function 9 minus x squared. Now that we switch from our discrete sum to a continuous sum, the delta x becomes dx, which is now infinitely thin. And then I just have to add up 9 minus x squared times dx for all the values of x's that represent a rectangle. And the rectangle happens, the rectangles happen from 0 to 3. So we'll integrate from zero to three. I'm gonna just calculate, this one's a nice easy uh, integral that we can calculate by hand. So I'm gonna calculate it by hand. In so far as I'm gonna use my hands to grab my calculator and math nine, nine minus X squared. And we get 18. And right now the integral is looking at me and it's like, oh, dude, it came out to an integer and you didn't want to calculate this by hand. Michael, that's why you got the nine minus X squared because it'll make the three and then 
That's why you pick nine minus X squared instead of four minus X squared. Because when I integrate the X squared, it becomes a third power and I introduce a three denominator and it'll cancel out with all the threes that I'll be plugging in. I built this one to be done by hand. That's why I picked nine instead of like four or 25. And yet, Lazy teachers got a lazy. Anyway, so no problem, you think. We already knew this because we find area under curve by integrating function. But that's too shallow to just think of it that way. We can prove that this is too shallow to just think of it that way because if we change the question from area under curve to distance traveled at this velocity, then unless that was on our list of things to remember, we don't know how to set up the problem. Which means if you don't know how to set up that problem, you didn't know how to set up the area problem, you were going on autopilot because someone said area under curve is definite integral. Then if they were really insidious about it, you would say, hang on a second, why is definite integral under the uh, definite integral telling us the area under the curve? And your instructor just said, because it is. And you said, all right. And you didn't want to put it back against the power structure. So, to make sure that we understand this concept and we're not just going to go on autopilot and find area under curve, we're going to calculate the same area, but with a different rectangle. So there's a whole second set of rectangles that we can use. So same region. The way we calculated the problem, the way we calculated the problem was to say that for each different X value, we had a different height. For every X value, we had a different height. So we're gonna do the same thing but for every y value. I want to say for every value of y, we have some rectangle. So instead of a horizontal stack of rectangles in the previous, in the previous integral, where we have like a bunch of books, now we have a stack of infinitely thin paper. We still have a, a height. Uh, we still have this different x and different y, but we're reading it differently. In the previous problem, we said for every x, there's a different height given by y. Here, we're saying for every y, there's a different height given by the x. Now the setup goes similarly. The area of the slice is still length times width. But now, instead of my length being delta x, we're getting infinitely thinner books. I'm going to make L delta y infinitely thinner paper. So my area of the slice is still the width, but not times delta x this time, it's times delta y. In this case, the width is not the same as y, the width is the same as x. So the area of the slice is x times delta y. 
But now we have the same problem that we had in the previous in integral. I can't integrate x dy just like I couldn't integrate y dx. So I have to write x in terms of y. And so then we have to go back to our function where y is 9 minus x squared and rewrite that. So this means that x squared is 9 minus y. So x is plus or minus the square root of 9 minus y. Oh. Oh, there it is. So I'm going to replace x with plus or minus square root of 9 minus y. In this case, we're going to choose plus because x is going from 0 to 3. So we clearly want the plus one. So x is the square root of 9 minus y. Uh, and the delta y is still delta. And so our total area we're going to integrate the function square root of 9 minus y our uh, discrete delta y becomes a continuous dy and now we got to add up all of these rectangles every time we multiply the square root of 9 minus y times delta y for all the y values that we had a sheet of paper in our infinite, uh, our stack of infinite paper. Infinite stack of paper? Stack of infinitely thin paper? Some permutation of that. So for each y value, we have this, this height. So we have to integrate over the y value. So y equals zero to y equals nine. This is one we can also integrate by hand. So we use our hands to pick up our calculators and ask for the integral of nine minus y dy from zero to nine. And we get 18 again. Clearly, we can see that the calculator is doing some kind of approximation technique and then flexing on how many decimal places it can hold. So it's not just 18, it's 18.0000000. So tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, millions, ten, 25 million. So in this case, the calculator knows all these decimal points, but it doesn't have the intuition to say, oh, I probably just rounded something off a little bit. And this should just be 18. It can't look at this and see this nine minus y to the one and a half power being a two thirds nine minus y to the three halves power. Those three halves are just gonna make square roots. So where are we gonna get, where are we gonna get things from? Uh, what are we gonna get from where? We're gonna get square roots. So maybe square roots could be providing some irrational numbers, but then we gotta think about what we're plugging in. We're plugging in a zero and a nine. We aren't getting irrational values. Where else can we get fractions? Well, it's a one, nine minus y to the one half power. So when I integrate it, it'll be a two thirds nine minus y to the three halves power. So that two thirds could introduce denominators of three. So I could have 0.3 repeating or 0.6 repeating or 
zero. And that's the only, those are the only so sources of non-integers here. So it's not unreasonable to look at all those zeros and say, that's not a one third or a one, oh, that's not a one third or a two sixth. What's going on here? Maybe I should just call this a two. You know what I mean? Intelligence is knowing that a tomato is fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put tomato in your fruit salad. I realize that after that, the creative part is just to make salsa, which is kind of a fruit salad. But it's more of a vegetable salad. I can't, I don't know, is the main, the main component is tomato, but it's adulterated with vegetables. This is why salsa is better than fruit salad. Fruit salad is like, well, no, only fruits. And then tomato comes along and says, yo, I'm a fruit. But fruit salad is like, you know, racist. So they're like, oh, no, no, no. You have to be the right kind of fruits to be in the fruit salad club. See what I mean? I guess the other important point that I want to make here is that when you're solving and you have to use square roots and you're solving, that's always going to produce a plus or minus. Don't always just think in terms of funky and embrace the pluses or minuses, but realize that that's just a decision point. We have to look at what we want, plus or minus, or are we going to need both? That's, that's, that's the consideration. Can I just pick one or do I need full? In this case, we look at the values of X that we're gonna be getting. X is for going from zero to three. We can see that down here that we want the plus one. If this happened to be on the other side, so nine minus Y squared, the X axis, and, or um, oh, I forgot, I wanted to, oh, I didn't use Y. So if I just took this nine minus X squared and looked at the negative version, then instead of the plus square root of nine minus Y, I would use the minus square root of nine minus Y. But then once we did that, maybe we'll notice that this is symmetric about the Y axis. So it doesn't matter which one we pick, we just have to pick one. Any questions? Now I could change what we have to do in this problem by taking out the Y axis as a boundary and find the area this whole parabola. Well, that's not the whole parabola, but both sides of the parabola. All right.
let's not pretend that I'm not going to do this problem twice. So let's consider the finite region bounded by the graph of nine minus x squared and the x axis. So what I want is this little chunk above the x axis. A lot of similar stuff happens. The top is still up here at nine. Over here, we still got three. In the center, we still got zero. But down here, now we've got a negative three. So let's do the same thing that we did before. Let's do the problem by looking at this as a stack of infinitely thin books. So a shelf, let's say, of infinitely thin books with this vertical slice. So I'm gonna do the problem in the first way with a delta X. So it's a shelf of infinitely thin books. So it's the horizontal. This is defined by a y and x goes from uh, zero to the slice. So in this case, the width of the slice is going to be covered up by the y area of the slice. I wrote a weird and then it threw me off. The area of the slice is still a rectangle, so it's still length times width. I'm gonna say that the length is the delta X like I did before, and the width is going to be the height. So we can see the width can be replaced with Y and the length with delta X. And then just like before, I can replace with y, replace y with nine minus x squared. That part didn't change. We we're doing the same thing. We just made a longer shelf. Then the total area, since it's a delta x, the total area will be all will be the integral over all the x values where we have a book. So the X values, they stop at three like what they did before, but now we've extended our shelf to cover the X values down to negative three. So our total area will be the integral from negative three to three, which will be 36, because we had previously one half of this is 18. So two of them are gonna be two 18s, 2016, 36. 40, negative four. Is everybody okay? All right, let's take a look at this same region, but instead of our shelf of infinitely thin books, we're gonna make a stack of infinitely thin paper. 
So instead of vertical slices, we're going to make horizontal slices. The change here from the previous problem is that our slice is going all the way across. We're still calculating an area, and area is still just length times width. So the area of the slice is still length times width. Notice that this is a stack of infinitely thin paper. So instead of delta x, I'm going to be using delta y. I'll still make y the length, or delta y the length. The delta variable I'll still use as the length, and I'll label the width on my picture. Now, this is where things are different. Before, our width just corresponded to the y or the x. But now the width corresponds not to the y. So here's the y. And not just to the x, but to both the x's. So there are two x's here. Let's call it x1 and x2. So the width is going to be the distance from x2 to x1. So in this case, the width is going to be x1 minus, I spelled one wrong, saved it. The width is going to be x1 minus x2. It's the distance between those. Um, distance between x1 and x2. So just find the difference. And we want the width to be written in terms of y, but we, I'm sorry, but we want the width to be written in terms of y. So just like up above, our, the area of the slice is going to be the width which was x1 minus x2. Times delta y. Now this needs to get fixed because I can't integrate x's dy. So we go up to our function. And we solve for x. So x squared is nine minus y, so that x is plus or minus the square root of nine minus y. Last time this decision was easier because all the x's were positive, I clearly want the plus square root of nine minus y. But in this case, I have two x's, and there are my two x's, the plus and the minus. So it looks like x1 is going to be the plus square root of 9 minus y, and x2 is going to be the minus square root of 9 minus y. So if I have plus square root of 9 minus y, minus a minus square root of 9 minus y, that'll give us 2 square root of nine minus y. We came to a plus or minus, and then we have to decide which one do we need? Do we use one or the other or both? And in this case, since there were two x's, clearly we're going to be using both the plus square root of 9 minus y and the minus square root of 9 minus y. 
At this point, we can also point out why I said x1 minus x2, because I want the difference between those two. I want to know how far apart they are. If I just did x1 plus x2, since they're opposites, I would come up with zero. So when you're thinking x1 plus x2, you're thinking x1 plus the absolute value of x2. And if we take the absolute value of, the, of negative square root of nine minus y, we get a plus square root of nine minus y. And when we add them together, we get two of them. What I need, I just, what I want right now is that everybody to be on board with the two square root of nine minus y. There's a couple of ways to see it. We could just subtract those two things. We could recognize that zero is the center of this parabola and the distance from the center is if it's plus square root of nine minus y on one side, it's going to be minus square root of nine minus y. So I just want two copies of that distance. There's lots of ways to see two square root of nine minus y. And notice that two does exactly what we, what we wanted it to do. The two in this second integral is going to do what at, uh, going from negative three to three did in our first integral. So we can factor out the two because I like my, inter my constants factored out of my integral. And we'll integrate the square root of nine minus y. Our discrete delta y comes to continuous dy. What doesn't change are the values of y. So we're still going to integrate y equals zero to y equals nine. And so where in the first one, we doubled up our area by integrating from negative three to three instead mm -hmm. of from zero to three because we had an even function. Here, the doubling shows up in two times the width. So we still get 36. Any questions? So when we're calculating areas like in these, these kinds of problems, when we're looking at or even if we're calculating volumes and we're looking at uh, side view. It's really important to remember that you have choices. You'll, you can always choose to slice vertically or horizontally. Sometimes one will be more convenient than the other. The other thing that goes along with having a choice meaning that you must learn how to do both. Every time you're faced with an area problem, you now have two area problems. You have a choice about how you're going to slice it, but you only have that choice by learning both methods. So when you're learning things, you have to learn all the methods so that you can make a choice. If you only know one method, then you actually don't have a choice. See what I mean? If you only know one thing, then you don't have a choice. And our psychology kind of has trained us to want choices, but not too many choices. Any questions? You've got to be able to look at things as shelves of infinitely thin books or stacks of infinitely thin books.
I'm having a hard time coming up with what line I want. I wonder if there's anything going on like next door that might be distracting me and keeping me from concentrating, even on simple things. No, I'm sure that's not it. I think we're used to be able, being able to do facility things at any point because we haven't been here. The faculty and students have mostly not been here. Anyway, um, here's what I'm aiming for. So here's what I'm aiming for. I want a line. So this point up here is at zero nine, but then right next to it, one unit over is gonna be the point one eight, uh, negative one eight. Because our coefficient is a negative one. So down here is the point that I'm aiming for. Oops. Um, three zero. And I just want to connect these with a line. So I guess what's this line going to look like? Uh, it's going to have the point negative one eight. So I'm going to write it as eight. And it's going to decrease by eight every four units. Minus eight every four is two every one x. Is that right? No, nope, because it's not starting at zero. Yeesh. Negative one eight, slope of negative two. Three one is four times two is eight, minus eight is zero. Good. Successfully able to write this equation over line. So I'm looking for the finite region bounded by these two graphs. So I'm talking about this thin slice up in here. So, okay, now I see like the among us face, and then this one gets sliced. Anyway. Never actually played Among Us. It's just, I, you can't not be aware of its existence. You know what I mean? All right, so where were we? Oh yeah. So I want this slice up here, this piece up here. All right, so uh, what we want to do is still think about slicing vertical and slicing horizontal. One of these is going to be nice and simple. The other one is going to be a bit of a mess. The important thing is not to identify the simple ones, but to identify the one that's going to be a mess and why is it going to be a mess. So we want to think of slicing vertical. or a stack of papers, which is horizontal. One of these is a problem. The other one is really simple. Let's not call it complicated, let's just call it messy. The other one is messy. So 
find that region. So the region in, in question is this region here. This is what we're gonna, we're gonna work on this tomorrow. We'll see why, uh, how to slice both ways. One nice slicing, one slicing is very messy. All right, that's gonna do it for today. I will see y'all on tomorrow. Everybody have a good day and thanks for playing.